Okay, thank you for the introduction. So the embedding scheme is polarizable and it should treat all excited states on the same footing. So kind of the polarization of the environment is included by induced dipoles, but kind of for each excited state, we have different dipoles. And so we want to include the entire response from the solvent, the entire electronic response of the solvent. So why is polarization important? Because basically all biologically relevant photochemistry happens in solution or in some protein environment. So here's kind of the retinal molecule that is responsible for vision. And the QM, kind of the, the photoactive part is very small, but kind of the environment can be, can have an important impact on the dynamics. And polarization is particularly important when charge transfer states are involved, because the position of charge transfer states can change by as much as one electron volt. So here in this figure, I show an interface between a pentacene, between pentacene and fullerenes. So if this interface absorbs a photon, then an electron hole pair is generated, which then can kind of separate. And the attraction between the electrons would come out completely wrong if we treat, it, treat this in the gas phase, where we just take kind of a minimal system of one pentacene, one fullerene. So the environment is very important. And in this case, if we assume that the polarizability of the fullerene is like 500 angstroms cubed, then we get a stabilization of the charge transfer by as much as one electron volt. So polarization is by no means a small effect. Now, the specifics kind of, there are lots of models for including kind of polarization, so the linear response models, state-specific models, and the kind of, I will just kind of talk about one specific problem. Okay, so, so uh, okay. I'm kind of, so the, the context is we want to simulate state-specific polarization in QMMM simulations. And the reason is that particular charge transfer states are affected hugely by, by polarization, even if the solvent is kind of non-polar. So for instance, in this example here, fullerene and pentacene are both non-polar molecules. So fullerene is totally symmetric, but nevertheless, charge transfer states are stabilized by a kind of one electron volt or more. And one popular way to include solvation is state-specific solvation, where we select the state of interest and then calculate the solvent reaction field for that um, state and solve kind of density and solvent reaction field self-consistently. But we run into problems if states cross, because then it's not clear which state should be used for the solvent reaction field. And this becomes particularly problematic when we try to optimize conical intersections because it's not clear which state should be chosen. So it's for the diagonal elements, it's kind of clear. So for instance, for the A state, we would choose the density of the A state. For the B state, we choose the respective density. But there is no way to select the off-diagonal elements. Should we choose the density of A or B? So it's not clear. And also, if we make any kind of choice, we run into the problem that we get different Hamiltonians for different states. So the states are not kind of eigenstates of the same Hamiltonian, so they are not orthogonal. And kind of all the transition properties, like non-adiabatic couplings, kind of um, or transition dipole moments, are not well defined. So with this method, it's not possible to optimize conical intersection. And if the goal is to find a Hamiltonian that is the same for all excited states, but still includes the full state-specific polarization. So um, now I give just some background of what polarization is. So we have some, if we have some external electric field and an atom with some polar polarizability given an angstrom cube, then the electric field displaces the electron cloud and then some small dipole moment kind of is, is induced and the length of the dipole moment is proportional to the kind of polarizability. So this is a vastly exaggerated kind of depiction. This is a very, very tiny effect. So the field 
that is in generated by this dipole has then this kind of form. So the scalar product of the dipole times the position vector divided by the cube of the distance. And we can generate calculatric field by taking the gradient of the polarizability of the potential, which is then proportional to the induced dipole moment. And there is the this factor here, T is called the dipole field tensor. Um, so what is the energy of this polarizable atom, of this polarized atom? So first we have to kind of polarize these so we can separate this into two steps. First, we polarize the atom very far away in the field free space, and then we move it against the field to the position where we want to have it. So the, the first energy part is this U0. So the we see that the inverse of the polarizability enters this expression. So the larger the polarizability, the easier it is to polarize the, the atom. And then there is this scalar product of the dipole times the electric field. This is kind of the energy needed to move the polarizable atom against the field of the QM region. Now we can repeat this. So we build the system up, the, our MM system up by adding one MM atom after the other. So then we need to create the MM, polarize the MM atom and move it against the field of the generated by the electron density in the QM region. So if we already have some MM atoms, then the MM atoms, the dipoles of the MM atoms will also interact. And this is this additional term, which is like P times the dipole field tensor times P. So we can repeat this for all atoms, and then we get this expression. The first is just the atomic polarization energies. Then the second is the dipole field interaction between the MM dipoles and the QM field. And then the last term is the interaction between the induced point dipoles. And this, we can combine the individual vectors for each MM atom into one long super vector. So this is kind of P is just the stack of all these um, individual polar, polar, induced polarizations. And F is kind of the field of the QM region. And then we get this expression. So this can can simply can be simplified further. So we know, okay, the field in the QM region is just the kind of field generated by the density. Then we calculate the um, induced dipoles, which are proportional to the total field, which consists of the field of the QM region, and then the field generated by the other dipoles. Then we solve this expression for the induced dipole with this kind of B matrix. Is a huge kind of a geometry dependent matrix that has kind of the polarizabilities of each MM atom and then this um, dipole field tensor. So in total, this is kind of the expression for the polarization energy of the of the kind of holes of the MM region. Now this is kind of just kind of just the usual textbook knowledge, but now the kind of the new thing, which is um, the specialty of the direct reaction field is to note that these fields are actually quantum mechanical operators because they depend on the electron positions. And not just there are also not just the electron positions, but also in the positions of the nuclei and the point charges. So this is a quantum mechanical operator. And the so it um, the the a matrix here is just a, um, just depends on the coordinates of the MM atoms. Now we can split this field operators into electric fields and fields generated by the nuclei. Then you can see that the polarization Hamiltonian contains terms that are two electron operators because the field on the left depends on electrons on electron coordinates. The field on the right depends on electron coordinates, which of different electrons, or the electron can be also this kind of the same electron and it's one electron operator. Then the second term is just the interaction between the electronic fields and then fields generated by the nuclei. And then the last term is just a geometry dependent um, term that does not depend on ele electronic coordinates. So this Hamiltonian is then added to the um, 
normal molecular Hamiltonian. So it's the same Hamiltonian for all electronic states. So it, it does not change with the state of interest. It's the same Hamiltonian. And so that ensures that transition probabilities are all defined properly. So this method is actually very old. It's called the ERF, direct reaction field method. And we just, our kind of new, so it was developed in the 80s, but our contribution is that we calculate all the integrals involved exactly. So we need special so-called polarization potential integrals, which have this form. So we implemented these integrals in an efficient GPU code, which is also kind of published and can be used. And now I will give some more detail, kind of another way to look at this kind of polarization operator. So we can write this, um, this expression field times polarizability tensor times field in, in a different way. So we can say, okay, we just change the effective Coulomb interaction between all charged particles. So in bare vacuum, we have just this one over R dependence, but then in the sphere, in this kind of, in the polarizable environment, we get this additional term here. And because the A matrix is positive definite, this term here is always negative. So the Coulomb interaction is always lowered between all particles. So the electrons, they don't just electron one, electron two don't just interact directly, but they also interact through the um, solvent. And this lowers the, um, the um, lowers the Coulomb interaction. So if we want to add this into a quantum chemistry code, that means all the matrix element that involve Coulomb interactions need to be modified. So we need to modify the nuclear-nuclear repulsion, the electron-nuclear attraction, and the electron-electron repulsion. So in total, kind of our polarization Hamiltonian changes the electron-electron repulsion integrals and all other integrals. And we can absorb these changes just directly into the integrals. So we don't have to make kind of any other change to the, to the algorithms. We just have to change the underlying integrals. So to, to do this, we kind of first need to calculate some basic integrals. And these are the field integrals. So these are the kind of expectation kind of the matrix elements of the electric fields at the polarizable sites. And there are many of them because for each polarizable site, we have a matrix that scales like NO times NO. So this kind is like, has the size of, if you have 1000 mm atoms and it's 1000 times number of AO squared. And all other integrals are um, calculated on the fly. So, and in TerraChem where we implemented this, we can build kind of the, we never calculate the two electron integrals, but instead we, we formulate, all methods are formulated in terms of generalized Coulomb and exchange bills. So, and the additional terms that need to be added to J and K are these two expressions. So we need to contract the field integrals with some generalized density matrix. And for the J build, this can be done very e efficiently. So here, because the contraction can be written as a matrix matrix multiplication, which can be done very quickly on the GPU. But for the K build, these are kind of the order is, is problematic. So one either has to do non-sequential memory access or one has to kind of change the memory layout between the between different multiplications. And this kind of a time limiting step of the whole operation. So Overall, the method scales like n squared for large number of m atoms. Now here I show some computation, the computational cost of the method. So this is a calculation for a small kind of die in, um, in a shell of n hexane. And as the shell kind of increases, the computational cost increases, but also the energy stabilized. So for the locally excited state, it doesn't matter how large the shell is, so it's almost converged, but the charge transfer state really stabilized by more than 0 0.1 electron volt as the non, as the NXN shell increases. So this is interesting because NXN is non-polar. So this is just the infinite frequency dielectric response of the solvent. So how does the method scale? So all terms scale 
linearly except for the terms that involve the A matrix, the multiplication, because the A matrix is quadratic, is a kind of, so it's um, kind of a, we need at least n squared operations to calculate this if we do it just brute force. And this is currently the time limiting step, and there are some ideas how to improve this. Now I want to give quickly a kind of make a comparison with the self-consistent reaction field. So if we start with this expression for the polarization energy, then the, in the self-consistent reaction field, we first calculate the solvent response for a given state. And then we, cal so we calculate the fields, the expectation value of the fields for the state of interest and plug it into this expression. And because the fields enter quadratically, we have a complicated nonlinear dependence on the state of interest and we require self-consistency. So in the direct reaction field, which was invented by Van Duin and Toll, we don't do this. We just treat the whole polarization energy as a, as a quantum mechanical operator, then it's still a linear operator. There's no nonlinear dependence on the wave function and it also captures some dispersion interaction because the square expectation value of the square is not equal to the square expectation value. And now we tested this on a set of bichromophoric dyes, but I won't go into detail because, uh, because of time. So that we showed that we can actually optimize conical intersection in solutions. So we get the crossing points and we see the expected stabilization of the charge transfer state. Um, I will more focus on the second example, which is the bacterial reaction center. Um, bacterial reaction center and the primary charge transfer. So the purple bacterial reaction center contains a number of chromophores which are embedded in a protein environment. So in the these two um, bacterial chlorophylls have a special pair. They uh, um, absorb a photon and then a very fast charge transfer reaction happens along one branch. So they are this kind of um, the chromophores are arranged symmetrically, but only one branch is actually active. And there are lots of different theories why this asymmetry, um, how this asymmetry is created. And one theory is that the, um, the protein environment induces an asymmetry. So the kind of because the amino acids in the left L branch and the M branch are different. And so the induced kind of electrostatic fields in the environment are different and this favors one branch. So we used our um, QMM embedding scheme. So we treated some of the chromophores with the QM method and the protein as polarizable um, MM, MM charges and calculated the left and the L branch. So this shows the induced dipole moments for the S1 state. So in the, if we just plot the dipole moments, one doesn't see a lot, but if we subtract the dipole moments of the, of the ground state, then we see that this, um, the electron and the hole are screened by the surrounding. And we compare this for the left branch and then for the L branch, then we see that in, if we just do the gas phase calculation, so without any solvent, then the initially excited exciton state is much, much lower than the charge transfer state. So charge transfer is simply not possible. And if we include electrostatic embedding, then the charge transfer states come down, but they're not really asymmetric. So only if we include state-specific polarization, we get a result that's compatible with the experiment. So the inactive branch is slightly higher than the initially excited exciton states, while the active branch is really low. So, th so this is totally compatible with experiment. So we show that induction stabilizes the charge transfer states by as much as one electron volt, and it induces the asymmetry between active and inactive branches. Then we could, and if there are lots of experiments that look at this, and we try to extract from our simulations quantities that are directly comparable with experiments. So one experiment uses the vibrational Stark effect to measure the, um, the local electric fields around each chromophore. So these 
um, bacterial chlorophylls have lots of CO groups, and each CO group kind of is, has a diff can be distinguished by its frequency because the local field is different. So basically, what they get from the experiment is the projection of the local field onto the um, onto the CO bond, and then they can out calculate the difference between the frequencies on the L branch and the M branch, and then decide which kind of how does the local electrostatic field look like in the two branches. And we can extract this, um, these quantities also from our simulations by just putting a pair of point charges at the bond and then calculate the forces on these point charges. And we actually get kind of, we get um, kind of shift, frequency shifts that are comparable with experiments. So these are kind of, they are within the error ranges. So there are diff a number of different Kind of, so there are several experiments and some sometimes kind of conflicting numbers, but we get results that are within the right kind of range. So with this, I conclude. So we have implemented the direct reaction field method that capture, captures both polarization and approximately dispersion. So it's a state-specific solvent. And if it includes the full state-specific solvent response, but just uses single Hamiltonian. So we can describe state crossing and couplings consistently. And in particular, we can optimize conical intersections in solution. So we implemented this into the GPU accelerated TerraCam code. It works for any method straight out of the box. So for Hartree-Fock, time-dependent DFT, CAS-CF, CAS-CI, and also the gradients work straight away. So it has linear to quadratic scaling. So currently we cannot, we can use it for geometry optimizations, but not yet for dynamics. So for dynamics it's too slow and there need to be kind of some additional um, um, theoretical developments are necessary to make it suitable for MD simulations. And as an example, kind of we test showed that it um, gives results that are comparable to the experiment for the bacterial reaction center. So in, where the ground state, where the ground state electrostatics and the induction of the protein favor charge transfer along the active branch. So here's a kind of the publications, if you are interested in some more of the details. And with, say, with this, I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer questions if you have any. Thank you so much, Alexander. Thanks. Everyone, thanks you. <laughs> now we have uh, four minutes for maybe two quick questions. Um, do you want to unmute yourself? Go ahead. I, I have a couple of questions, uh, Alexander. I thought great talk really um, made me uh, made me think a lot about uh, you know connecting this with other things that um, I've seen and that we've done. Um, so what, the, what is the connection between what you're doing and something like a um, uh, like thinking about the uh, DIM QM of Lasse Jensen, where essentially he has uh, polarizable dipoles in um, the environment, but also I think um, others have done similar, have implemented similar, um, models. When you have polarizable dipoles in the environment, I would think you obtain a very a similar um, type of response, right? Um, so I wonder what what are the differences and similarities with with that kind of approach. I mean that the the, pol the the polarizable dipoles are, are operators of the. In our case, they are operators of all the electron coordinates, so they are not just kind of. They don't depend on any specific state of interest. So, so, so the special part of the direct reaction field is that you don't first calculate the fields, then calculate the, the polarization energy and plug this back in into the Hamiltonian, but kind of the you get an operator that depends on all the um on all the electron coordinates. But these electron coordinates are electronic coordinates of the QM uh, system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah the QM so system. essentially what you have is um, polarization plus, uh, uh, you know, indirect polarization where the, 
electrons polarize the mm part and then mm part polarizes the electron. So you have these two electrons. But isn't that also the same physics that arises from uh, this uh, polarizable dipole environments like from uh, Lasse Jensen or Benedetta Menucci that I know of, but of course. Yeah, the, the, the point is if you have multiple states, then it's different because you also get kind of, if you have a single state, then it's it's similar. But if you have multiple states, you get, I mean, it's, I, I mean, there's, I think could, there could, could, could it be said that it's fundamentally a question of where you put the expectation value? Yeah, yeah, this is this, this graph, this slide. And, 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 and in some limit of an isolated electronic state, as you were saying, it, it does become equivalent, but it's different. Yeah, this is kind of the yeah. In, in that this limited. on the left is self. I mean, there's linear response. This is, but linear response doesn't capture all the polarization. If you have charge excited state charge transfer, then it's kind of underestimates it. Yeah, it's, this is kind of the difference between self-consistent reaction field and direct reaction field. So in one case it's an operator, in the other case it's like it's added after calculating the wave function. Uh, I have a related question. So if you change the number of excited states, electronic states that you consider, uh, will your answers be different? So say you consider just one state and then you consider two states or four states? Um, depend, I mean, if the states interact, yes, but I think also when you do a kind of I mean, if the so states saying, don't interact, if there's a large gap between the states, then no, then it will not differ. But for instance, if you if you're close to a conical intersection and you just include one state, then I mean the all already without polarization can you can get the wrong answer if you don't include the next highest state. Say, but you, you're saying that for non-interactive states, right? So not near the conical intersection. Uh, the state-specific response would be uh, the same as your... Uh, yeah, I think so, treatment. yes. Okay, uh, sorry for... I mean, you get, you. Sorry, sorry, just to, to add, I mean, okay, what, what you don't get is that the disper you get some dispersion interaction. So in fact, you overestimate the dispersion interaction that you have an excited state that's very diffuse. Then kind of you get the dis kind of the the attractive interaction with the between the um, I mean it has a larger polarizability to get that additional energy too which you don't get from the self-consistent reaction field. 